Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Masha. I'm from the University of Queensland. So I'm located here in Australia, which is nice. It wasn't too far for me to come here. And I'm a principal taxonomy curator of Genome Taxonomy Database. That's a knowledge base that has been developed at the University of Queensland um, and specifically at the Australian Centre of Ecogenomics. Ooh, so I see my slides are probably not going to look like on my screen. <laughs> Sorry if something is not. Okay, so I believe that most of you are not familiar with prokaryotic nomenclature and taxonomy. So I decided I just give a brief overview of what's happened in the last 30 years in a space of prokaryotic nomenclature and taxonomy. Um, but first of all, I decided also, you know, I'm not going to reveal my age and, you know, not going to the past history. But ironically, it happened that the first study that used 16S RNA gene to characterize microbial communities from environmental samples happened to be in 1985. So now you know my age. And what's happened next is that there was this massive explosion of studies that start characterizing uncultured microbial diversity based on this molecular chronometer 16S RNA gene that allowed us to reconstruct you know, phylogenies of cultured and uncultured microorganisms. But specifically, there was this realization that you know, we don't know much about microbial diversity because much of it is sexually uncultured. So what we knew in the past was mostly based on cultured isolate that are stored in culture collection. And in 1994, there was a term candidatus that has been proposed by the International Community of, um, International Committee of Systematic of Prokaryotes. And that has been outside of the International Code of Nomenclature of Prokaryotes. So people decided, well, we don't want to regulate the naming of this taxa we are not sure whether those tax actually exist, whether those organisms are real. So we're gonna give them this provisional status and you know, see what's happened. So what's happened next in a space of taxonomy is that there was explosion of different methods and new technologies that allowed us to profile microbial um, community and a more uh, deeper resolution scale. So there were the methods like multi-local sequence typing that appears then um, we had the first precedence of using metagenomics in 2004 that allowed us to tap really into the space of genomic sequences from uncultured prokaryotes. And there were a number of methods that has been proposed also de to delineate species uh, known from the sequence data, such as average nucleotide identity, amino acid identity, and so on. And DNA, DNA hybridization that has been traditionally used for circumscribe a species in prokaryotic taxonomy has been replaced with digital DNA, DNA hybridization methods. And so on, we saw this transition in methodologies in prokaryotic nomenclature from phenotypic taxonomy towards more genome-based taxonomy. And at the same time, on the right, so you see that what's happened in nomenclature is that after the term candidatus was proposed, um, Shortly after there was this discussion about biocodes where people start realizing, well, we have five different codes of nomenclature. Why we need so much? Maybe we can align them all and name organisms, you know, with a unified convention. But unfortunately, that didn't fly. Uh, in 1998, the file code was proposed. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. So that's the concepts of naming taxa based on plates and phylogenetics uh, groupings. And in 2001, so International Committee of Systematics of Prokaryotes decided to go in a kind of strict way of formalizing naming of taxa and ask researchers that if you want to formalize a name, you actually have to, you know, prove that you have that organisms by showing that you have axenic culture, pool culture, and deposited in two different culture collections in the world. And this created a big problem because first of all, not all countries is allowed to do that, to share their genetic materials. Second, a lot of microorganisms are uncultured, some of them fastidious, some of them are not you know, really hard to maintain in pool cultures and so on. So we had, you know, from 2001, then they introduced these rules. We had a massive chaos in prokaryotic nomenclature where people were naming taxa in a very chaotic way. There was no standardized way of naming uncultured majority. And in 2016, one of the members of the ICSP proposed that, 
you know, did a really modest proposal, what he called, you know, saying, okay, let's use genome sequences as types to attach the name. That didn't fly with ICSP, they rejected it. And what's happened next is that in 2017, so just, you know, before this idea of gene sequences as types were proposed, we launched the GGDB taxonomy where we start classifying cultured and uncultured majority in a single unifying framework. And in 2022, the C code has been published. So I will talk about, today I will talk about those two initiative and databases. So as again, as I say, taxonomy has been really a function of methodology in prokaryotic systematics. So we had this transition from phenotypic towards genome-based taxonomy, but there was no solution for users, for microbial ecologists and microbiologists worldwide, how they would, you know, classify the taxa in a uniform way and how they will account for novelty when they recover something new from environmental samples. So we come up with a solution and in 2017, we launched our first public release of genome-based taxonomy. And we said, well, we need a taxonomy that is based on a sound phylogenetic framework that will resolve polyphyletic groups that are known to exist in the current taxonomy. And they take into account relative evolutionary divergence because what existed before never take the rates of evolution into account. And therefore we had this massive discrepancies between taxa of the same rank, where we have some genus that are very deep in one taxon, when you compare it to another phylum, it's very shallow and so on. So we come up with this solution and what in brief it is, so GDB is an, essentially it's a knowledge base and it's based on concatenated protein that novel phylogenies. Um, it is highly standardized in, a, in the sense that the species is circumscribed based on average nucleotide identity, so which is accepted gold standard currently in prokaryotic taxonomy. The high taxa delineation are based on relative evolution divergence or what we call red values. So this is a temporal bending that allows researchers to say whether they're dealing with a family, class, order, and so on. And the GDB currently sources all those genomes from the NCBI. It coordinates its releases with the Refrix, RefSeq releases approximately every 12 months. And we're using NCBI taxonomy and list of prokaryotic names in standing, with standing and nomenclature at the primary sources of names and types information. And as an output, we're providing the complete standard taxonomy. Ooh, I'm too late. Yeah. <laughs> For both cultures and cultures prokaryotes. Okay, I will speed up here. Right. So GDB providing as a, as a database, we provide a number of community services. First of all, we give the three viewers so people can have a look, you know, which taxa belong to which in our interactive um, drift live. We also provide a toolkit where users can classify their old genomic sequences according to our framework. Uh, we provide all the data that, you know, all the taxonomies and the flat files, and they're all linked to the genome sequences from NCBI. Uh, we do have a tracking system where users can see whether the classification has been changed between releases. Uh, we do have also fast any calculator, so that's something to allow people to compare whether they, you know, dealing with the same species or not. Uh, we have API uh, and we have forum and also contact form where we can discuss. So when, first of all, we introduced the GDB taxonomy, we realized that wow, actually only 80% of tax that we have have validly published names. And why so? As I said, this was due to that technological advances in the field that we start recovering what we call metagenomic assembled genomes or this uncultured majority that was unnamed because it couldn't be named under the official prokaryotic code. And so effectively it's happened that approximately 85% of phylogenetic diversity is uncultured and it is unnamed. There was a, a lot of heated discussion around this. And as I told you, the International Committee of Systematic Prokaryot rejected the idea of sequences to surface types, but then separate initiative called CCOT was established and in 2020, uh, 2020, we published C code. So that is the nomenclature code for prokaryotes described from sequence data. Right. Um, briefly, what it is. So, N as a C code is very similar to the ICNP. There are a few deviations, but it's following binomial nomenclature and very similar rules. 
but the type is a genome sequence instead of physical entity such as a culture. There are different passes for naming taxa and registering them under the C code. Um, I probably won't dive into it too much. And just to say, so we have its own dedicated online registry, which is operate under the pair principles. Um, there are different ways to register taxa through the individual uh, submissions or batch submissions. There are a number of automatic checks that are performed for the uniqueness, for the adherence, for the criteria of the type genomic sequences, and, eventually, and also manual curation. And eventually that results is in a name to be validly published if the publication has been effectively published and the sequence meeting all the criteria as well as the name that is proposed to it. And yeah, on this, I would like to finish and acknowledge the members of the CCOT committee and members of the Genome Taxonomy Database. So this is my team. Uh, in the center, you see Phil Hugengolds, uh, who is my supervisor and who initiated the Genome Taxonomy Database and our team. So we split between curation and development team at ACE. Um, I'm a principal curator. We have really brilliant uh, development team and yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think we have time for two questions. Hi, uh, Catherine Silliman. I'm uh, with NOAA in the United States. Are there tools to cross talk between some other existing reference databases like the Silva taxonomy to be able to map that with the taxonomy that you guys have developed? Yeah, thanks. So that's a great question. And that's something that has, you know, a lot of people, a lot of users were interested in. And recently, Green Genes Database released its second edition, mm -hmm. <laughs> where they tried to map 16S sequences from Silva to the genome-based taxonomy. And that has been published a few months ago. So I'm not aware this moment how this will fly. Methodologically, it's a bit complicated. Uh, and we do have more 16S sequences than we have genomes at the moment, just because of his historical, you know, starting from 1985, mm -hmm. as I told you. <laughs> um, Silver is currently in a stagnation phase. Uh, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. Um, but ideally, Yes, it would be nice to match and to have this congruence, but somebody have to do it. We are not able to provide the services because we already have been involved in providing what we're doing. So, but we do provide 16S sequences that are mined from our uh, genomes that are used in classifications. So people are encouraged when they propose new taxa to provide, you know, genome-based taxonomy and 16S phylogeny and show congruence, but we don't, we can't provide quality of 16S because there are multiple sequence 16S that are associated with the same prokaryotic species. They could be not identical, and that's we can't solve that issue. <laughs> We're mostly focusing on genome based because we believe that's the best way that we should reconstruct phylogeny. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Our, ne <laughs> Our next speaker is Quentin Groom. Present yourself. Okay. Yeah.